right, if you haven't been with us for the last several months, we are in a year-long series titled The Hero Challenge. So just so it makes it easier, we don't have to change out slides and create new videos. <laughs> just kidding, no, that's not the heartbeat of it. Actually, really what we are passionate about, it really comes down to what I define as woo. Everyone say, woo. <laughs> and uh, it is wisdom and understanding. And we're desiring to not only come and get information, we're looking for transformation in every area so that we can begin to, and just as we were just closing worship there, talking about God being our king, that we could understand in every area of our life that our, those particular places, our spiritual life, our recreational life, our physical life, would, would begin to look like the kingdom of God has come that compassion and grace and mercy would start to flow. The love of God would start to move into each of those cracks and crevices. And you know what I find to be really amazing is the definition of the word believer. You know what, you know what a believer is? Someone who believes. believes you know. All of us have, at one time or another, we, we have believed. Uh, we, by definition, have been a believer but then there's something that sometimes we, we miss out on that is the actual ongoing process of believing. Are you with me? <laughs> like sometimes we, 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 we've made a decision for, for, for Christ, we've surrendered our life, and then we've, we've defined ourselves, we go to church, we do something, we, we're a believer now, but, but sometimes we leave out the process of believing. And uh, I, I believe that uh, in this sort of series that, that we would, would take some steps in our lives to be able to allow God to begin to just open himself in, in a new way, give us new perspectives as we open up our hearts and we, we begin to say, all right, I'm tired of just saying I believed. I'm just tired of saying I believe. I want to be believing. I want to be active in participating, in trusting in the adventure and the uncertainty and the, and the place that God would lead me. Because when God starts to lead your life, stuff starts to get pretty exciting and cool. God begins to open doors that nobody can shut. God begins to explain and help you as you look back and he starts to kind of un unveil things as you trust him in your life. But sometimes it's difficult for us to be in the believing because we want to be in the arriving. And God is saying, no, I want you to be a believing believer so that you can begin to experience because I know more than you know. And, and I'm working things out ahead because he goes before us and he is behind us. And sometimes it's hard to trust that. But I believe, and we started this year looking at those two words, wisdom and understanding, because they were... It was the prayer uh, of transformation for Solomon, who was the richest man alive. He was a trillionaire, had great wealth. And I, I thought, you know what? Solomon's prayer wasn't, God, make me just ridiculously wealthy. But he prayed at the age of 12 years old for discernment, for understanding, and for wisdom. And I'm on that path. I personally am on that path. God, any area of my life, I do not hold it as a sacred thing that I'm locked into, I just want to trust you. I just want to, to see your wisdom and understanding as you chart my course, as you've given me an assignment so that I can fulfill what, what your heartbeat is so that I can help to establish your kingdom on this earth. Can I get an oh yeah to that? And so this morning, we're, we're going to look at another strategy of Solomon. So this is sort of a sub-series sub in our main series, The Hero Challenge, called Solomon's Strategies. And we're gonna look at a, a scripture verse in Proverbs, and this will set the tone for us. And I have another acronym for you. So I know you're excited, and so am I. Proverbs 10.22 out of the New Living Translation, it says, the blessing of the Lord, it makes a person rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. That, that, that is, is, is pretty... Um, power packed, but I won't comment so much about it. I will just say that most of us have probably in a community like we're surrounded by have seen people who have lots of riches, but have lots of sorrow. 
Riches don't necessarily make people happy. Um, some would, would argue with me on that. I didn't say they were bad or evil, and they certainly can help in situations. But there is a blessing that the Lord gives that makes people rich, and there's no sorrow that gets added to it. And I want to look at that this morning, don't you? I want to I wanna dive in to kind of understand a little bit about what that blessing that the Lord gives to us, what it looks like, how it translates into our specific lives, and, and, and what did it look like in the lives of other individuals. And we're going to start off looking at Abraham, Genesis 12, 1 through 20. I'm not going to read it all, but I just want to read this portion here. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I'll make your name great so that you will be a blessing. All right? Now, God begins to expose us to understanding the heartbeat of why he gives us resources, talents, time, treasure. And he he describes and lays out in the life of Abraham he, he shows the wisdom of the blessing of the Lord that he gives that makes us rich, and no sorrow gets added to it. And so the first thing that we identify in Genesis 12 is the fact that God says that I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing. Everyone say ing. And I, I like ing words because I run, but I'm not running Because if I was running, I would be doing that right now. God says to Abraham, I'm not just going to bless you. um, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. So uh, not just so one time, but on a consistent basis, I am going to change you. And he says the same to us because you know what? Father Abraham, he had many sons. And many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. Let's just praise the Lord. Came, that just came to me in my heart. No, I, I don't pass over that, though, because that blessing that was bestowed upon Abraham and his descendants is your rightful inheritance. God has blessed you. The Bible says that you're complete in Christ Jesus, lacking nothing. Colossians 1.20, that you have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now, sometimes we struggle because we don't see ourselves as a blessing. We see ourselves as a person who needs one. But I want to change that for us. Because if we get the perspective that God gives to us, it puts us in the position to remove the obstacles. I'm rolling up my sleeves now. It's on. It's on. Right? Because if the obstacles get removed and the insecurity and, the, and the, the small thinking that sometimes we get locked into and the past and the pain and we start to see ourselves the way that God sees us, which is what he desires, so then we can move into the activity that he called us to, to be in, which is dropping the kingdom of heaven on earth, establishing his kingdom. And how do you do that? You do it by being a blessing. And I believe that in our neighborhoods, in our community, in our city, God has desired that you and I be the blessing, be the individuals that are continually on a consistent basis participating in this process because God's blessing makes you rich and he adds no sorrow to it. This isn't a lottery ticket, guys. This is truth. As you and I open up our hearts to be a blessing to other people, and we open up our hearts to bless and to speak words of life and encouragement, to to use everything that God's given us to open our hearts to the people that are around us, God begins to make us rich. And no sorrow is added to it. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 8 through 11. Are you with me this morning? It says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency, that means 
All, 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 if you had a pantry, it would be stocked full. All sufficiency in all things at all times. You may abound in every good work as, as it is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply, multiply your seed for sowing. Ing. Say ing. Ing. And he'll increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. That's pretty awesome. So God blesses Abraham so that he will be a blessing. There was an interesting study that I read recently about uh, some missionaries who had a strategy. One set of missionaries had a strategy to be converters. And so they went to a foreign country and decided that they were going to convert. And another group had the strategy to be blessers. And they discovered that the group that decided to be uh, converters, uh, their level of conversion or their number of conversion was a lot less than the blessers. The blessers who decided to go into the community and be a blessing to it, to learn and to hear and to interact, had 50 times a higher conversion rate than those being converters. And I think that the problem with a lot of us, if we've ever participated in any type of evangelism strategy or technique or whatever it was, always rooted in some weird, strange thing of conversion rather than what God established us to be, which was people who would be a blessing. Amen. I mean, being a blessing does not does not put you in the mode of being a person who notches things on your belt. I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only person who grew up in that type of environment, but I did. I, we, we did cute street um, enactments in the heart, uh, for those of you who might know that, or we would pass out tracts that sometimes look like money, um, which is lame. And <laughs> have you ever been involved in a lame evangelism strategy? Okay, just raise your hand so I don't feel so bad. Thank you so much. And I, and I shouldn't, you know, God uses things, all kinds of things to, uh, to awaken people's hearts. So I won't diminish those. But I will say that there is a strategy rooted in Scripture that we see that God gives to us to be able to effectively transform communities, to transform our workplaces, to transform um, our city. And so here's, here's you know, you know this, this, this word that we're going to use today, which is bless, as the formulated strategy. I don't even like that word, but I will say that it is a heart strategy. It's a heart thing that God gives us. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm ready. I'm, I'm ready. I've been ready for a little while, but I'm, I'm ready for a collective group, the church that God's called, who see clearly God's foundation and love and his goodness and his mercy and his grace. I'm ready for us to awaken. You can call it revival, but I don't like that word because revival means you're dead, and I'm not dead. I mean, I, I, I'll call it an awakening collectively that we begin to open up our hearts to seek God and to ask him to utilize us to change and to reshape our community and our culture. And so we'll start off with B, okay? If you got, if you got a pen, uh, taking notes, go ahead and write this down. If you don't, write this down too. The first, and this is, this is pretty, pretty simple, right, is to begin with prayer. I mean, here's the question. Here's the prayer, and it's, and it's an audacious one in my mind, and it's, God, how do you want me to bless the people and the places that you have sent me to? How do you want me to bless the people and the places that you've sent me to? Prayer is, is not mind, you know, turn your mind off and just, just sort of go into automatic, you know, Christian vernacular. Prayer is, it's, it's vision, connection, you know, what, where there is no vision, people perish, but when there is one, when people start to, to, to open up their hearts and their words start to connect with the scriptures, as God tells us that he's given the nations as our inheritance, and we begin to get a vivid image in our mind of the people that God's placed us around, and we say, God, how do you want me to bless them? What, what do you want me to do for them? For my next door neighbor, who has turned me into the HOA three times. It's a long-standing joke, and it's happened to us. How do you want me to bless them? And as you begin to focus in prayer and ask that question, guess what the Holy Spirit does? He actually gives you 
pictures and ideas and ways. And some of us are, are, are a little intimidated. Maybe, maybe we don't want to be one of those, those people that heard from the Lord, but I'm going to tell you this. This is a secret, okay? A secret I learned a long time ago. When something that comes to your heart sort of floats up and you get this idea to do something that, that is both build somebody, it edifies, it exhorts or comforts someone, guess what? It's not the enemy, right? If it's going to encourage them or be a blessing to them, just go ahead and go with it, no matter the outcome, because it's going to be all right. Now, if it is to go bash them and to destroy them with scripture, that's the enemy. If it's c- condemning and, and, and pulling them down, and, and that, then that, don't go with that one, all right? But if it's bake some cookies, write a note, tell them that God loves them, ask if you can do anything, mow their lawn, high five them as you're walking their dog, I don't know, whatever it is, it's, it's going to be God, all right? Listen to what 1 Timothy 2 says. First of all, then, I urge you that supplications and prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth of God's love and his goodness. For there's one God, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So I urge you, make those prayers. Now not, oh, prayer, I make prayers. No, God, how can I be a blessing? And you listen. And all of a sudden your sensitivity, because now those people that, you know, and this is the problem, we, we all know this, not here at E3 Church. I mean, we know this at E3 Church, but we don't do this. But a lot of times when we identify people groups under labels, it, it causes us to not see them as people anymore. And, and then we, we insist on being right about things and, and, and holding up we, what we think is truth. Listen, before, you know, and, and it is cliche, but people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And if your first inclination, because you have had the information overload of Christian knowledge, is to slice and dice people, I want you to reconnect with the heart of Jesus. I want you to see his life through the Gospels. And I want you to see how he took people that were either caught in the act of adultery, that were sleeping around, and I want you to see how he responded to them. Listen to his words and watch how he treated them. And instead of trying to execute what you feel is right, ask yourself, God, give me a heart to understand who they are, where they've been, and how I can bless them. And I guarantee you, it'll change your trying to be right. I mean, Christianity is about establishing God's kingdom. It is about mercy and forgiveness. It's about love. It's about getting to know people. And this city is ready for it. People who you think are so well-to-do and so t- all put together are in need of somebody to offer them a refreshing cup of encouragement and insight and blessing. Someone that you think, no way they would ever, you could ever imagine that you come up and say, hey, I, I just got this $10 gift card. I don't know. I just felt like I just wanted to give it to you. You have no idea. You have no idea. And you may be thinking to yourself, I would sure love that. I would just love it if somebody would just do that. As you start the process, you begin to watch what God does. Because there is a river that's flowing. It is flowing right now. It's it's a melody. It is a tune, what I call the God groove, that is ongoing, that doesn't cease. And when you get in rhythm, when you get in the flow, you, you begin to be a part of the process. You with me? Begin to pray. Begin with prayer. Second is listen. We have a tendency, obviously, and we read this last week, James 119, my dear brothers. <laughs> this is like, my dear brothers, please. Right? And, and, and sisters. I think he probably put the emphasis on sisters second because take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And slow to become angry. And he says, I want you to not just talk, but I want you to listen to people. Here's the deal. 
if the people that are surrounding you, you've already passed judgment and, and you already identify them under something, under an umbrella, under a title, then you don't have time to hear their story. And that's a problem. Because their story is what God wants to open you up to because you have no idea why people do what they do. You have no idea. Believers and non-believers. You just don't know. You can, you can, you can have heard you can have heard somebody say, this is why people do that, but you don't know. And until you pass judgment, I want you to open your heart up to it and listen to their stories. So if you and I, we begin to pray for people, ask God, how can we be a blessing? If you start to listen to people around you and you're asking the Holy Spirit that God's given to you as a comfort and a guide, Help me to understand this person. They're driving me bonkers, right? And the Bible tells us to bless those who curse you. Why? Because it it reverses the process, changes you. Because as you bless, you have to get invested. And God is probably awakening you to the boss that you can't stand, to the person who chews their gum and annoys you a certain way. He's probably going, hey, don't miss my perspective. I want you to begin to pray for this person. I want you to get invested in their life. At least that's what I've noticed in my life. God, no, those people are just absolutely annoying the bejesus out of me, if that's a word. And he says, well, listen to their story. Hear what they have to say. The second one is eat. Thank you, Lord, for that one right there. All right. Have a meal with somebody. I mean, this is, this is biblical. Luke twenty two nineteen. 19. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, And gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given uh, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, here's a quick little spin, you know, in in my heart on this. He took bread and he broke it. Now, we take elements and we drink and we eat it. But I believe that there's something also here too. He took bread, he broke it, and he told them to do this in remembrance of me. That there is a process that takes place in sitting down with a meal for somebody that you and I probably haven't seen the supernatural element of, but I believe is resident there. That God says, take and eat bread with other people. Do it in remembrance of me. And here's what I did. I poured out my blood. I gave of my body. I want you, when you sit down with a meal, I want you to invest yourself this same way. And I want you to do it in remembrance of me. I mean, I think there's wisdom there. I think there's wisdom. And when we do a meal, some of us are foodies, right? And we, we like it. And that's why I asked you earlier, what was a memorable meal? And I've had a few. But my favorite meals are the ones where everybody got together in the meal, participated in the cooking, and then sat down together in a long, drawn-out process, and we, and we shared, and we ate, and we had connection. And God's designed our eating to be something supernatural. And I, and I feel like maybe we've lost a little bit because everything's quick and easy. And maybe the fasting that you, you, you get compelled to do is to stop eating fast food and to take longer, slower meals with people that God is asking you to be a blessing to. Those people can be right here in this church. These people can be uh, your next door neighbors. And I told, I told my wife, we're going to do more blessing this way this year. I got a grill. I, I, I've got, I've got, we're going to do more blessing because I guarantee you that the biggest blessing in people's lives is just the mere fact that you want to spend some time with them over a meal. Right? I mean, how many of you would be blessed if you shared more meals with people just in this room? Raise your hand. <laughs> Every one of us. We would enjoy it. So let's make that part of the blessing strategy. Right? And the next one is to serve. So if we begin to listen and we begin to pay attention, then people begin to tell us things. And they give us insight into what they need. And, and, and they begin to, to open their hearts up. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deed and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light shine. Let it shine, and and letting it shine has to do with going out of your way to be a servant. And being a servant goes back to our Proverbs, Solomon strategy of wisdom, that as you begin to serve people, God begins to make you rich and adds no sorrow to it. 
Now, I don't disclaim, but I do know that I've been alive long enough to participate in this process to know that God has a way of outgiving you and I. He just does. It's part of his nature. He is a giver. And when you get in the rhythm, when you get in the groove, when you get in the flow, I can just tell you right now, as you step outside of your insecurity and everything and every reason that you may have why you can't be a blessing to somebody else, and, and it's financial, it's, you know, uh, it could be social, whatever it is, but if, if you get rid of that, I can guarantee you this year that, that you will see some things start to take shape like never before. I believe one of the, one of the key ways that God uses, or I should say God develops the destiny of our lives is with the people that he surrounds us with. But because we're sometimes too fixated on getting to the destination, we miss everything that he puts around us and all the gifts, talents, resources, and people. But all of a sudden, when we start to, to, to realize and become believers believing, believing God where you just placed me, I didn't just come to E3 as a happenstance, that you placed me with a group of people, and there's a process as I believe you, as I step out to trust you, as I, as I don't uh, doubt and, and, and sort of go back and forth when, when God called you to this area, wherever you live, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Gilbert, whatever city you're from, but, but when God said and instructed and led you, you've got to trust it. You, you, you can't waver. You've got to trust it. And you got to invest fully. Because if you don't invest fully, then you'll never watch as God opens up doors and avenues and people. And by the way, it's not even about you. Let me say it again. It's not even about you. Right? You're, you're not the main show. He is. He came to establish his kingdom, not yours. But he did promise you the best possible life. And he did promise that he would lead you to it. You've got to trust it. You've got to trust it when you feel like all of your hopes and dreams are invested here. You've got to trust him. You've got to be a believing believer and not just a believer who believe. Duh. Believed. There we go. All right. Let your light shine. I don't know if any of you saw this recently too. And the last, the last S is to share the story. Um, you know, I find it interesting, but I, I, I did see on a Twitter feed or Facebook or something like that that Megan Fox, anybody, does anybody, guys, you probably know who she is. Uh, ladies probably don't. But Megan Fox just is recently started uh, to go back to church. She had a, a foundation of it, and um, she was talking about her experience and her husband and stuff like that. And I, and I thought, you know, how much, I just saw lots of, lots of communication back and forth on that. Um, but I thought also how powerful a story is. And whether or not you care or, or whatever, that, that's not the point. The, the point is the, the story that you and I have is so unique. What I've been through and what you've been through are totally different. How, how good you were growing up and how bad I was growing up are, are completely different. But the beauty is that God, he takes a mosaic of people and he uses each person to, to have a story. And if you look at Acts 22, 23, Acts 26, you, you really see Paul share his story. I mean, you should read those. I, I take time to do it because, I mean, he was killing people, you know? I mean, I, I don't, maybe some of you have. I don't need to know it. But, you know, maybe some of you have, have been at that point, and that's all right. But God... He uses that story always. You know, there's been times where I've been ashamed of my story. I, I've been ashamed at some of the mistakes I've made. And over, over time, as I began to understand God's goodness and God's grace, because it was in the midst of my story that I began to get a revelation of God's love and his goodness. And then I had the confidence over time to begin to share my story. And that story has helped people. Because guess what? I found out that other people make mistakes. So weird. And other people are, are interested in authenticity. And so sometimes we're scared of our stories. And sometimes our stories are still in process. But we have to, to do a better job of recognizing that blessing people is sharing our story, sharing our hurts, sharing where our, our marriages 
went awry, where they totally blew up, but you're still standing. You're still here. God's restored you with new relationships. God's done miracles in certain parts of your life. You, you got through a, a, one situation, and now you're dealing with another one. It's that struggle that people connect with. We have to own our stories more. And we have to be able to, at the right time, right, at the right time, share those stories. Because as we begin to pray, as we begin to ask God, the people that you've put me around, how can I bless them? And as you begin to listen and you hear and you begin to have meals and you begin to serve those people and then you start. I almost feel like, for me, until the rest of that process, until I have, have been a steward, until I have rightfully been a steward, I, I don't even have the right to share my story. Before, before a person is going to hear my story and what God's done, I'm, I'm going to take time to listen and to pray for them and to have meals for them. Because I would never want a person to, to, to hear the story in, in, in thinking that I was trying to notch them on my belt. But I want that story. And that's, that's me. I mean, that's where I'm at. But I believe that, that God's heart is in this that God desires us to be able to, to love people in a greater capacity. And this, this method, strategy, whatever you want to call it, is, is what I, I believe God wants to utilize us to start to do. Now, here's a cool thing. How many of you would like to see more of your friends and more people that you know right here at E3? Each one of us, we're, we're owners. Each one of us, we, we've, been, we've been given stewardship to begin the process. And, and really, it's, it's, not, it's, not just, it's not just this building. I, 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 that, that, to me, is because you and I are the church. That's not the thing. But, but if each one of us began to, to bless others, as each one of us opened up our hearts, it becomes exponential. It becomes a, a huge establishment of God's kingdom in this community. As you and I open up to God's grace, his mercy, his goodness, we start to love people in that way. We start to eat with them. We start to fellowship with them. Guess what? God begins to make us rich. He adds no sorrow, and people's lives get changed. And the kingdom of heaven is expanded, and people get to know what you know about God's love and his goodness and his grace and his mercy. Can I get an oh yeah? 1 Peter 3.15 says, Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your Christian hope, I'll be, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to explain it. Now, I, I know that people have asked, asked or, or sort of set up their story this way. What was your life like before Christ? How did you come to know him? And what is it like afterwards? I mean, how is, how is Jesus who we sang about earlier as our king, how is that changing your life? That's a good question because I think we get to, to points where there's, there could be stagnation. But, I, but I'll tell you what, this process, this strategy of Solomon to be a blessing will begin to move you and I into an ongoing process, an ongoing transformation a, a, a time and a place where you and I can begin to share with each other and ask this question, who did you bless this week and how did it go? Not, not as a, who did you bless this week? But did you get a chance? Did you get in on the vision? Did you get on, on the excitement? Did, God, did the Holy Spirit speak to you? Did God speak to your heart? And did he give you this crazy idea where you're like, yeah, I decided to put a post-it note on somebody's computer and it's crazy or blah, blah, whatever it is. And so this morning I want us to just, I want us just to open up our hearts to this process. Can, can we? Do you remember it? Bless? Okay, what is it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think we can. I think we can remember it. Acronyms, yay. Thank you, Lord, for acronyms, right? Anyway. Let's pray. Let's ask God to open up our hearts wide. Let's, let's ask him to give us his eyes, his heartbeat to see the people that he has surrounded us with. And, and let's just ask God to make us a blessing today, right now, today, that he would just awaken our hearts to it.
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be participants in your blessing strategy. Father, every life that you touched, every person that you healed, all the hope that you gave, you invite us into that. When I, when I think about it, I think about the, the people that you've surrounded us with and you want us to just love on them and to bless them and the, the opportunities that arise and the change that can come to a city, the change that can come to families, the change that can come to people who are single and feeling lonely. Father, for, for people who, who are older, people who are younger, people who have children that are disabled, people that are struggling to find jobs, people that are going without, people who have everything that they could imagine and still feel pointless in this life, God, you've asked us to be a blessing. Lord, we ask that you would open up our, our, our eyes to see ourselves the way that you do, as a blessing. And Father, to see the people around us as the ones to begin to bless. Father, we're asking you to awaken our hearts this morning. We want to participate. We want to be involved. We want in on this. So God, we commit this morning to begin to pray. We commit this morning to listen and to hear and to be obedient, to speak what you say to our hearts. We commit to have more times of, me of fellowship and meals with people that, that you put across our paths to listen to their stories. Father, and to serve in 2013, to serve like never before, God. And last, to be able to share the story that you have dropped into in our lives, wherever that is in the process, and to be able to be strong and saying, yes, God loves me. I know this. And I want you to know that he loves you too. Right, right now this morning, God, just waken us to people and faces individuals, neighbors, co-workers. Lord, we'll be faithful to bless them and to be the blessing that you've called us to in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. This morning, I